Hi everybody, it's my pleasure today to tell you more about Mu0, our latest algorithm that connects the benefit of tree search with MCTS and a learned model. First, I want to cover the benefits of search and how Monte Carlo tree search works and then connect this to how we can learn a model of the environment and then use it to plan with the search. So let's start at the beginning. Of course, the ancient board game of Go. This is how our story began with AlphaGo. And there our challenge really was this, you know, this very ancient game with a very large action space. So many possibilities, too many to exhaustively tackle them with a normal heuristic based search. So we tried to use neural networks to help the search. The first network that we came up with was the value network. It's equivalent to some intuitive estimate of how well am I doing in this position. And with such a network, we can really cut down on the depth of the tree. We don't need to search until the end of the game. We can only look ahead a few moves and then rely on the evaluation of our network to see how well we are doing. Next, we combine this with a second network, the prior or policy network. This network gives us an initial estimate of which actions are most likely to be the best action in this situation. Which, you know, as a human looking at a board, at a game, what would we intuitively do? And again, this allows us to massively prune the tree. Now we can reduce the breadth of the tree. We can start by only looking at the most promising variations in our search tree. Together, these two networks allow us to search the most plausible, the best possibilities first, a very effective combination. Now, of course, we have to still somehow choose which positions to evaluate. How do we combine these estimates from the value of the policy network? And this is where Monte Carlo tree search comes into play. On the one hand, we want to evaluate many interesting positions, many interesting actions. On the other hand, we want to aggregate all of this information into one good estimate that we can use to choose the best action. You know, let's say this is our search tree. The top of the tree represents the, the root node, the current position in the game. And as we follow the edges into the tree, down the tree, we can plan into the future. The edges represent actions and the circular nodes represent states in the tree. We can start at the root of the tree and then try to find the next most interesting node to evaluate. You know. And of course, how do we do this? We have a selection formula, in our case, based on PUCB, where we want to select actions that are both promising on the one hand, but also we might want to explore parts of the state space that we have not seen before. So we have a very classical exploration and exploitation trade-off. And the PUCB formula allows us to combine our two network estimates. On the one hand, we have the aggregated value information. And on the other hand, we have the initial prior over how good an action might be. And we can scale these by UCB constant. This may be looking a bit complicated, but actually in the common case of where we train and use low numbers of visit counts, where we have small trees, only the left hand is relevant. And what this basically means is that initially we want to rely on our prior estimate. And as we search more, as we visit more a node, we want to increasingly rely on our value estimate because this tends to become more accurate over time as we average more values. And so we can apply this formula recursively starting at the root of the tree. And at every level, we always pick the max UCB value. 
repeating this until we reach the bottom, until we reach a leaf, which has not been evaluated. And this is when we then use our neural network to evaluate this position in the tree. And we use this to get our new policy and value estimates. And we can then aggregate this estimate back into the tree. We can perform back propagation where we propagate the value estimate back up the tree. So every node in the subtree can keep an average over the value estimates of all its children. This is the algorithm that we used in the very first version of AlphaGo, which is also the version that played against Lee Sedol in South Korea. The first time that the computer Go programs could actually defeat human professional Go players. And so in this version of AlphaGo, the initial networks were still trained based on human Go games. So we were starting with supervised training and only later using reinforcement learning to improve our estimates. So the next step, of course, was to remove the supervised training and to train purely from reinforcement learning, purely starting from random self-play and iteratively improving from this point. And after this, the next step was to remove everything that was specific to Go and to generalize the algorithm further so it could tackle any board game. This was a very natural step for us. And at this point, also, we started to benefit a lot from the excitement in machine learning and deep learning and people investing in a lot of hardware. These are some of the accelerators in Google's data centers that we could use, the TPUs at the time. We later published this as Alpha Zero. And this was actually quite exciting to a lot of people because even though you know chess programs had obviously been superhuman for many decades, so far chess programs had always played very differently than humans, whereas Alpha Zero somehow had a much more human-like intuitive style of playing which is quite funny because it never ever saw any human games, right? It only trained randomly playing against itself. But somehow it ended up rediscovering a lot of the same similar knowledge in chess. Now that we finally had this general algorithm playing these board games, we were really excited to take it one step further. We wanted to remove any knowledge, any reliance on the rules of the game or any reliance on having a simulator that we could use in our search tree to plan. Because of course, in the vast majority of domains, there is no such simulator that we could query. There is no Oracle that we can ask, or oh, if I try this action, what will happen? In the real world and most expensive domains, all we can hope for is that we interact with the environment and maybe observe some reward and some observation. And so the domain we chose as a testbed for us was Atari, because this is of a course, a very classical and popular testbed for reinforcement learning with great many strong baselines. And the motivation for us was really, we wanted to predict exactly the quantities that we needed to plan the policy value and reward estimates, because these are what the tree search relies on for planning. So let me get into the main details of the algorithm now. Ah, wrong slide. So if we are in some you know, state S, schematically represented by this Go board here, how would we be able to plan? Of course, we cannot rely on the simulator. So we have to start by mapping this state into some abstract state space, into, the, into some embedding space used by our neural network. So we represent this as a representation function H that can map some sequence of observation to an embedding space. If we have, if we are in such an embedding space, then we can use this to make predictions. We can predict the policy and value estimate in this state. But equally, we can also 
design a transition function, a dynamics function that can take us to the next possible state. Given some previous state and an action, we can now estimate in which state we would end up in. And we can also estimate which reward would we observe in this transition. And just using these three functions, we can actually perform the full tree search, just like I explained a few slides previously. And we can run the full Monte Carlo tree search algorithm and train similar to an alpha zero. Now, of course, you might ask why planning? Isn't this a lot of effort? Other reinforcement learning algorithms have much fewer parts. Well, we can view planning as an improvement operator. We you know, start in some state, we perform our search, and we obtain an improved policy and an improved value. In other algorithms like Q-learning policy gradient, we might also form, for example, the one-step Q value estimate and use this to improve our policy. And similarly here, in mu zero, we can perform this many step look ahead, aggregated over a whole tree that we can then aggregate and use both to improve our value estimate, which would be, for example, the aggregated value at the root and the policy, which would be the statistics, the visit counts of all the child edges of the root. Once we have this algorithm to search in one position, we can also use this to generate whole trajectories. So we run the state, the search in the state, we obtain some search policy pi. And from this, we can sample, we can select an action. We apply this to the environment. We observe some reward u as we transition. And then we can just repeat this process until we terminate the episode and we have generated a whole trajectory. There are two important points in this process related to exploration. The first is about Dirichlet noise and exploration inside the search. If we only perform search with the UCB formula I showed previously naively, then we would never be able to explore actions that are assigned a prior of zero. Because these always have like the minimum UCB value. So instead, we also mix uh, Dirichlet noise into the prior at the actions of the root. And intuitively, you can understand this as boosting the prior of maybe a handful, maybe one random action high enough so that it is actually explored by the search. And this is very practically motivated. Before we implemented this procedure, for example, in Go, Alpha Zero would always get stuck playing at the corner of the Go board, the worst possible move, and never learn to get out of this. So exploration is very important part of it. The other part is about exploration and exploitation when we actually select actions and apply them to the environment. The distribution of these accounts generated by the search is, is a distribution over actions that we can sample from. And we can apply a temperature to this distribution to control how uniform versus how greedy we want to be. And this is also essential to ensure that we don't always generate identical trajectories, that we have diversity in our trajectories. So in practice, during training, we want to explore with some non-infinite temperature here. If you look closely, these trajectories also contain, contain everything that we need to train our model. We have policy distributions, we have value estimates, and we have re observed rewards. So let's see how we can align this, how we can possibly train our model with this. At the bottom, we have the trajectory that we generated, a sequence of states and actions. And at the top, we can see the mapping of the learned model to this. We use our representation function to map from the state to some embedding space. We use the dynamics function to roll forward, given the previous state and the action, how do we get to the next state repeatedly. 
and then we can use a prediction function to estimate prior and value. And these estimates, we can then update from the stored search information from our trajectory. So the top and the bottom, this is just symbolizing the same trajectory, but so you can see easily the stored search information. The training target for the policy for the prior is very simple. We can just update our prior towards the search distribution with a normal cross entropy loss. Similarly, the reward prediction is fairly straightforward. We can, from our dynamics function, regress towards the real reward observed in the trajectory. Finally, for the value, we want to perform end step bootstrapping so we can train in very long trajectories and so we don't have too high variance. And so we can combine a few rewards, n rewards from the real trajectory and then bootstrap from the search value at those end steps. And so those are the three main losses that Mu0 uses to train its model. You can see the whole system in a one diagram overview here. On the left, the Monte Carlo tree search should be discussed. Then on the top, the episode generation, and finally the training of the whole model. Now that you've seen how this works, let's look at a few results. Of course, we started with the classical board games, chess, shogi, and go, because this is where we had all our previous results with. And so we wanted to ensure that mu zero can actually reproduce the performance of alpha zero. We wanted to ensure that we don't have to give up any of the planning capabilities. And indeed, you can see the horizontal lines, the orange lines, show the final performance of alpha zero at the end of training whereas the blue curves show the training performance of mu zero over the whole training. And you can see at the end of training, it does indeed converge to the same performance as alpha zero, which was a very good confirmation for us. For Atari, we try to compare against the strongest baseline we could find, which was in this case R2D2. So the horizontal line show the mean and the median score of R2D2 across 57 different Atari games, whereas the blue learning curves show the performance for the mean and median score of mu zero over the whole training. And indeed, again, you can see that it matches and then even exceeds the performance of R2D2, setting a new state of the art. Here is another table where you can see the Atari results in more detail. And importantly, we can see that we actually used a similar or even smaller number of frames than the previous algorithms we compared to. This is important because in Atari or many domains, performance strongly correlates with how much data an algorithm can learn from. Which also brings us to the next main point that we worked on. Now that we have such a learned model, can we actually use it to learn more from each frame? Can we use it to get a lot more out of our data? Similar to how we as a human, we might reflect upon our past experience in our head. And so the central idea here is that we want to reuse old trajectories that we previously generated, and we want to be able to train again from them, which means that we have to be able to generate new training targets. And we call this reanalyze because we rerun the Monte Carlo tree search on those old trajectories, analyzing them to get new policy and value distributions. And now that we have those distributions, we can train from them. But importantly, we have to be careful now because we actually have multiple different timescales involved. We have trajectories that were generated at some time t. And then we have targets, we have tree search statistics that were generated at some later time, T prime. For some of the losses, this is not a problem, but let's look at it a little bit in detail. So first, let me introduce the two different timescales. For the policy loss, things are very simple. 
because we regress the policy directly to the search statistics, it only depends on the most recent statistics that we generated. The trajectory does not matter at all. It's simply a state to state loss. So this is very easy. For the reward as well, the reward only depends on the actual reward observed in a state's transition. The new search statistics don't enter the picture at all. It's only for the value loss where things become a bit more complicated. Because we're bootstrapping, we actually have a mix of the rewards from the old trajectory with the newly reanalyzed like, search value of the whole tree. And so if you look at it closely, we actually have three different time scales. When we generated the trajectory with network at t at time t, the tree search when we updated the statistics with a network checkpoint from t prime, and our current network that we are updating at t double prime. One simplification we can make is that instead of bootstrapping towards the search value, we can instead bootstrap to a target network. And then we still use the original rewards from the trajectory because this is how we ground ourselves. But now we bootstrap to a recent target network at the same time step. And in fact, this is the setting that we used in Atari in our results, where we use the target network to get fresh target network values and combat off policy and overfitting. And to be able to be more data efficient, first, we also increased the replay by 10x. Replay meaning how many times do we sample states inside our learning replay buffer on the training side. And we also use the reanalyze system I just introduced for 90% of searches. We only reanalyzed all trajectories and only 10% of searches were actually interacting with the environment and generating fresh data. And combining these, we get a 100x reduction in frames consumed during training. So we can go from 20 billion down to 200 million frames. And this turns out to be highly effective compared to other algorithms trained at a standard 200 million frame budget, we observe a very good median and mean score. So this was a great confirmation to us how useful planning can be, how useful the model can be for us. This reanalyze setting also fits very easily into the training setup. <clears throat> In normal training, we have a you know, standard setup with some actors and some learner that communicate by sending network weights and receiving episodes, receiving trajectories. So we can rearrange this a little bit. And now for reanalyze, the first thing that we need to introduce is a reanalyze buffer to hold all the episodes our actors have generated. So then later, when we have a second set of reanalyze actors, the reanalyze actors can sample these episodes to generate new trajectories. And the main difference is while the normal actors interact with the environment and apply the action here, reanalyze actors, there is no environment. We simply have stored observations and we are adding new search statistics. And for the learner, there is actually no difference between those two. The learner cannot distinguish fresh and reanalyzed trajectories, which makes it very easy to vary the proportion of reanalyze or completely enable or disable it. Finally, we also performed a set of ablations to investigate how well the algorithm was working and to understand it a little bit better. The first thing we looked at was the scaling of the search as we gave it more or less time. So in this plot, you can see on the y-axis, the playing strength in ELO, whereas the x-axis shows how much time was given per move, which means like how much search could we do. And the training budget was 1.1 seconds, and we evaluated up to two and a half orders of magnitude more search. And indeed, as we can see, the search scales extremely well. We can obtain a 1,000 ELO improvement 
by simply scaling up how much we search. And here you can see two lines where we're actually comparing the real simulator to the learned model. And actually the learned model can scale very well to more than two orders of magnitude more than it has seen during its own training, suggesting that it is quite accurate. And indeed, you can also see this if you look at the depth of those searches. So the x-axis is the same number, same plot of how much time did we have for the search. But on the y-axis, we can now see how deep did we search in the tree? What's the median depth of the tree and what are the percentiles? Next, we looked at Atari and the learning there. First, we wanted to make sure that our improvements were indeed from the search algorithm and not say because we had a good network architecture or a good general training framework. So we implemented a Q learning loss and compared results there on Pac-Man. And indeed we saw that with the mu zero and the search loss, we got much better performance than with the Q learning loss. We also looked in more detail at the benefits of search. <clears throat> in this plot, we varied how much search we did over the course of training. So every line is a separate experiment with a different number of simulations per move. And all of those lines were evaluated at the same budget to make sure that we can compare them fairly. And you can see that indeed, as we train with more simulations, we obtain better and better performance, both in terms of learning faster at the beginning and in terms of achieving a higher performance at the end. But what was actually really astonishing for me was that even with say six or seven simulations, which you know, is very little, is even fewer than the number of actions in Pac-Man and Atari, we could already achieve quite strong performance. But it's also nice to see that the scaling continues as we add more simulations. We also performed another ablation on the sticky action setting. The sticky action setting is a new setting introduced to ensure that algorithms don't you know, over exploit the determinism in the environment or otherwise fail when there is a little bit of stochasticity. It means that in 25% of cases, instead of the action selected by the agent, the previous action is repeated randomly. And we can see here that mu zero is not affected by this change at all. We can also see that actually both of the lines actually represent five separate training runs. And we can see that the training is actually very stable and reach, reaches the same performance really reproducible, which is very useful for our own experiments. Now, I hope I have convinced you a little bit why search is so important so central to our, our algorithm, because we really believe that it's a very effective policy and value improvement operator. You can see here on the sides in this plot showing the difference in performance between the raw network and the network when used in conjunction with search. <clears throat> in this case, it was the game of Go. And <clears throat> aside from this, there are some other benefits of using the search. One is that it can make for quite stable training because our losses become quite similar to supervised training because we have now a cross entropy loss in the policy <clears throat> versus other losses like policy gradients can be quite um, unstable at times. And it's also nice because we can easily scale the algorithm just by increasing the search budget we give it, we can try to achieve better performance. Finally, let me cover some possible extensions of the algorithm that we've, people have been thinking about. One, I think that is very classical in the literature is auxiliary losses. <clears throat> so for example, observation reconstruction which means that given the state in our dynamics function, can we reconstruct the observation of the state that we would really be in? in we've tried this in our experiments. We could not get any benefit from this, but this may have been because we were using the, a very large frame budget at the time. 
it's possible that at smaller frame budgets, this is more helpful. I think some of the literature suggests this. I think especially when we go down to 20 million or 2 million frames, this may be quite useful because the value and reward targets become increasingly sparse. Another possibility that's quite important, I think, is hierarchical planning. Currently, mu0 and the dynamics function of mu0 directly models transitions based on the action sequence, which means that the planning is inherently tied to plan one action at a time. But in many circumstances, we would like to either sometimes jump ahead or plan at multiple timescales. For example, you know, see this warehouse robot, you might want to plan the current movement very precisely, but then make a long-term plan over which packages to get next. <clears throat> so I think hierarchical planning, hierarchical RL will be a big source of improvement if you can crack it. Another possibility that there has already been some work on in the literature is to extend the algorithm to continuous action spaces. In the mu zero paper, we only had domains with discrete action spaces, but in, for example, continuous control and robotics, there are, it is very common to have continuous action spaces. And there are actually already some interesting papers about this. Now, finally, let me conclude with some general suggestions if you want to reproduce the algorithm or run similar experiments. First, of course, I'm aware that often for universities, for students, resources are the premium. So you would like to be able to run your experiments as efficiently as possible. For this, I would suggest to start with the 200 million frames set up from the paper. As is, I think it takes about 12 GPU days to train for one Atari level. And the cost there is primarily based on the size of the neural network. How many flops does it take to do one neural network forward? And the cost of the search, how many simulations per move do we spend to select an action? This is on the acting side. On, on the other hand, on the training side, <clears throat> it directly correlates to the replay factor. How many times do we train from each position that we have generated? Of course, if we train more, then we need to generate less data. And also batch size and training steps, how much do we train in total? And if you look at these parameters, there are some um, straightforward speed ups. We can make the network smaller by reducing the number of conf planes. We can reduce the number of simulations per move. Because as we've seen previously in the plot I showed, both 50 and 25 simulations, they all achieve very strong performance. Even going down to 10 simulations, you would probably still get pretty good performance. <clears throat> and on the training side, we can also reduce the batch size or reduce the number of training steps. Especially as we make the network smaller, we do not have to train it as much. We can maybe also start with a more aggressive learning rate. On the more general side, we also notice that it's extremely important to visualize things. Here, this is an example of the mu0 actor dashboard where we can monitor all the games it plays. Here it is training to play Go. You can see some estimate of the search values over every move in training. And we've really noticed that if we don't visualize things, we will never notice all the things that are wrong with it. Neural networks are really very good at taking slightly or not so slightly wrong input and still producing mostly sensible output. So it can be really hard to track down if not everything is perfectly aligned. Of course, you can also, if you are conscious about resources, it's important to profile to make sure that there is no bottlenecks in there. And even though most of my talk was about reinforcement learning, I'm actually a big believer in using supervised training to begin with because in supervised training, it is much easier to debug issues and to understand if something is going wrong. You can view this as you know, holding one part of the RL loop fixed and being able to really dissect the other part. And <clears throat> the first time I'm setting up a new domain or setting a new network architecture, this can make it much easier to compare things. 
testing. It's maybe not as sexy as machine learning and AI, but maybe just as important. Otherwise, we do not know if our papers might be slightly wrong or incorrect. So we spend a surprising amount of time on this. And also, you know, there's no reason to reinvent things if you can just reuse other people's work. I think nowadays we're in a great situation where there are a lot of very good machine learning frameworks. TensorFlow, PyTorch, personally, I use JAX a lot. And also on the environment side, we have a choice of an abundance of ready-made environments like Atari and OpenSpiel and Control Suite from Mujoko, which also has a benefit that it makes it much easier to compare results with other researchers. Personally, I always find it difficult if there's a paper that has results on their own new environment, because it makes it really difficult to put this in context to other research. Finally, once we, we have achieved, once we have achieved a good research, we really want to evaluate very reliably against the strongest baselines we can find, either human players, other agents, whatever is appropriate in the field. This is a picture from the match in China against Kojie, the world's strongest Go player at the time. I'd like to thank you for your attention. I hope the presentation was interesting and useful to you. And I'd like to open it to questions now. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Julian. Thanks for the nice talk.